now I'm there. Good to see everyone tonight. Hope that you've had a good week. We got to go way down here. Hold on a minute. Come on. We need to go way down, Shannon. Can you go way down? Almost the very bottom. Church leadership, elders. There we are. All right, good deal. So we talked about elders being an office that's throughout church history. Where other aides we've looked at, there's always been elders. Not necessarily the office of elder like we look at it today, but they've always had a function of leadership within God's people. From the days of the patriarchs to the days of Moses to the days of Jesus to the Christian age, they've always existed. So it's one of those offices that we've always had that's always been in existence. Um, and if you look at uh, the Christian age, we know that early churches were all self-governed. We know there, there was no central headquarters to them at all. Uh, elders existed in the Jerusalem church from a very early date, uh, probably transferred from the synagogue. So it's something that came along early. Uh, so we have that in front of us. Now we need to kind of look at these Greek words a little bit. I know you kind of hate to think about Greek words, but... I think in the case of elders, it's kind of important. There's three different words we use for elders in Scripture. Um, and uh, the first one of those words is presbyteros. And <clears throat> that can just mean an older person. doesn't necessarily mean an elder per se, the office. We run into that uh, even with deacons. The word deacons, um, deaconos in the Greek is servant. So... It can either mean servant or it can mean the office of deacon. So we have to sort of make distinctions in what we're talking about. Sometimes you see this translated as presbyter. It's where we get Presbyterian comes out of that word. Um, and sometimes elders can be called presbyters of a church. So that's where you get that word. Um, another word that we have that we see a lot is episkopos. An episcopos is generally translated as, as bishop. It's either overseer, it means an overseer. And it can mean not just an overseer of the church, it can mean an overseer in government, it can mean any kind of overseer. So once again, you have to make that distinction. But they're all descriptive terms of what an elder is. The last word is poimain. And poimain is shepherd. Every place you see shepherd in the Bible, it's a Greek word poimain. Now, unfortunately, in Ephesians 4.11, the word got transliterated, and we get the word pastor. So you and I hear the word pastor today more than we hear the word elder or shepherd or presbyter. We hear the word, that's a word that's very common in our society, pastor. And generally, when we think of a pastor, we think of a man who has a church or leads a church, one person. Generally, that's the way that's used today. The pastor of a church. A lot of times people will say, Pastor Rex, or you're the pastor of the Church of Christ. And I'm like, no, I'm not. Uh, that's not what I am. I'm not a pastor because I'm not an elder. And that, it's really weird how Ephesians 4.11 is the only place that word got transliterated. But that word is so popular in our society today. And it just kind of astounds me because it's just not a, it should be shepherd. That's exactly what the word means is shepherd. Uh, so the word pastor is a transliterated word from the Greek, right? That's why you take the letters, the Greek letters, and you move it to English. Transliterate. It's like the word uh, baptism. That's the same thing, the Greek word baptizo. And what they did was they just put English on there and made it baptism. That way they make their own word. So it's transliterated, what we call a transliterated word. So it's only found in Ephesians 4.11, and it means shepherd there, just like it means shepherd everywhere else in the Bible. But I think it's important we understand that. That's the only place that word is actually found in Scripture, is in that one, is in that one Scripture. So um, a lot of times today we say we have pastor-led churches, and generally when we say that, it means there's one man that leads a church and not a group of men. And when I was a Growing up, I grew up Baptist, and we had pastor-led churches. We didn't have elders. We had the minister or the preacher, however you want to say, was the pastor. 
and he was the one who kind of made the, all the decisions. And we had business meetings where people would vote like once a month on things, but ultimately he kind of made the decisions as far as what happened, what went on. Ultimately, it was his decision. Now, there were deacons that were servants there, but they didn't really have any leadership ability, so it was just him. So it was one man-led church. So I had a friend of mine just bought a church in another town and uh, decided it was going to be his church, and he's the pastor of that church. So it was just, he bought it, he, he's leading it, it's his deal. So that's kind of what generally what we think of when we think of the word pastor. So those three words are kind of the words that we see in different places in Scripture that we relate to being an elder, an overseer, or a shepherd. Those three words are the words we generally use in the church when we talk about elderships. We don't generally use the word bishop. We don't generally use the word presbyter. We generally use the word overseer. We generally use the word elder or the word shepherd. Churches today are more and more using the word shepherd. I, we, every time I go somewhere, it's all shepherds, shepherds, shepherds. We don't, we don't hear elders much anymore. Everybody's, churches are going to that shepherd, to that word, more than they are elders. That right or wrong and different, I don't know. I'm just kind of saying that's just how it is. I think if they like that word, it's a little easier, uh, maybe, um, maybe not as uh, commanding as saying uh, elder, maybe. Maybe a little more of a softer word to say, well, this is our shepherd's. As composed to saying, this is our elders. But it's the same. It's the same type thing. Are there any questions about that? So we have to decide, you know, when we're talking about the office of elder or when we're just talking about somebody that's older, if we use the word presbyteros. So it can be either way. When it talks about the older men, it can be older men like in Titus, presbyteros. Doesn't mean they're elders. Just means they're elderly. So we have to make distinctions when we start to talk about that idea. In Acts 20:28, 20, it says, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Now, once again, if we see that word, overseer, then we know that's the word uh, episkopos here is the word in the Greek. So he's made you episkopos. To poimain, to shepherd, which is what that word is, the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. So there we see both of those words. Neither one of those words there are capitalized. And so, you know, sometimes we kind of look at that as to what that means, the office. Paul says, be on your guard for yourselves for the flock. So once again, that leads to the idea of a shepherd, some shepherd over the flock. But then he says he's made you an overseer, episkopos made you an overseer over them. So elders have the responsibility of overseeing the flock. Not the flock worldwide, but the flock here. Okay? The flock. Our flock. That's their job. So in biblical sense, we're sheep. And they're shepherds. Okay? We're sheep. So we need to be good sheep. <laughs> so... So pasture is just transliterated in Ephesians 4.11. I don't know why that translators did that. I've tried to really figure that out, and I don't have a good answer. Young's Literal translates it as some as proclaimers uh, of good news and some as shepherds and teachers. So Young's Literal translates it the way it really should be translated. But in Ephesians 4.11, we see the word pastor. So if we compare those two verses, what exactly is a pastor? What exactly is a pastor? Should be a what? Should be a shepherd, right? Should be a shepherd. That's what it means. So a pastor in Scripture does not mean one man who runs everything or who over is over everything. doesn't have that meaning. One thing, the other thing about it is, is it's plural, okay, in the Greek. It's a plural word. It's not singular. It doesn't say he makes you to be a pastor. He says he makes some to be shepherds. Never singular in Scripture, ever. Elders, shepherds, 
Always plural. Never one. Right? Why do you think that God did that? Why should we not have one? Could we have one elder? Would that be scriptural? No, it wouldn't be. wouldn't be scriptural for us to have a single elder, would it? Have to be a plurality. We generally like to have an odd number, right? Lives with any board or most things that you're on. Generally like to have odd numbers because that's the tiebreaker more or less if it comes down to that. But I think in elderships, it's not that important, really. But it has to be plurality, at least two, right? So can a preacher be an elder? Absolutely. Is that a good thing? Probably not. <laughs> but if a church doesn't have enough men that are qualified to be elders, then I think it's good that a preacher can be the elder, can be one of the elders, right? I think that's good. Hopefully you would have at least two other guys besides one elder and the preacher, right, <laughs> that would be elders. But you can, preachers can be elders. So, you know, it's I, the ideal situation is that's not the case. Ideally, that's not the case, right? I would love to at some point in my life be an elder because I kind of desire to do that at some point in my life because I think that's the greater office. But as long as I'm preaching, I really do not want to, I would not want to be an elder because I think it's better if preachers aren't elders. Unless it just has to be that way, you know? So that's just Rex's opinion. And I'm sure everybody's got another opinion. So... Um, Anyway, in this case, once again, plurality. And once again, that word, terrible word, terrible transliterated word, means shepherd. The only place we get that word, and yet we use it all the time. I always think that's just fascinating to me. We just wear it out. And really, it's just not even a good, not even a good word. So, uh, so anyway, but that's how we see it in our society today. If you look at church plants, Paul's missionary journey, um, in Acts 14, 23, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commanded them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Now, we need to talk a little bit about when they did that because Paul went through those churches, through those towns, and started those churches, right? And then when he came back through, they put elders. So he didn't do it on the first run through, Right? He did it when he came back. And I think there's some significance in that, in the way that he did it. But there's also some very interesting things about church plants here. We talk about planting churches, and that's a good thing. If you can plant a church, I think, I think that's a good thing. But in the Bible, the ministering evangelist always kind of had control of it, like Timothy or Paul, until they put in elders. But it wasn't long before they put in elders. They didn't keep that very long before they put elders. And Paul says, and Acts, Luke says here as he records this, he says they put elders. And how many churches did they do it? In every church, right? Every church. So they had to make elders in every church when they came back. Now, them people, a lot of them people, had not been Christians very long. Am I right? I mean, because these churches are new, right? So some of these elders probably came out of synagogue, Jews that were converted to Christianity, that were, that were elders in synagogue, probably would have been a good choice for an elder, right? Because you got to remember, they didn't have the Bible like we have it. They didn't have God's word in front of them. So the elders that they chose had to be people who would know something about the Scripture, about God, right? Because they did, weren't able to rely upon the Bible like you and I are able to rely upon the Bible. So, er, But it still was important that they had leadership, right? Leadership. Leadership's important in a body. And so that's why Paul did what he did. He went out, he started these churches, and then on the way back, which would have been several months later, maybe even a year later, he would put elders, they would put elders in these congregations. Every church, every church he planted, he would do elders. So it gives you an idea of how important it was to Paul that it's our only biblical example of planting churches, is that churches aren't under other churches. Elders aren't over multiple congregations. 
Now, sometimes if churches in a city plant another church, those elders might have to be over that church when it originally started, maybe, to just get it to go. But once they do, they immediately should be putting elders in that church. We're not supposed to be over different churches. That's not how God set it up. So I think it's very specific how we're to do this um, as a congregation. Are there any comments? So we know in first, we call these the pastoral letters. Now, once again, I said the word pastor is kind of a bad word to me. But we say it because 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus were letters that were written specifically to men who were in the process of making ch planting churches or making them grow or putting in elderships. They were, and so we call them pastoral, we call them the pastoral epistles of Paul. 1st, 2nd Timothy and Titus, the pastoral epistles. That's what they've been labeled over the years. That's what we call them. So Paul wrote these letters to individuals instead of churches, okay? So there's only really one other letter Paul wrote to an individual, and that's Philemon. And Philemon has nothing really to do with churches, so that really doesn't count. All the other letters Paul wrote were either to regions, like Galatians. Galatia was a region, or he wrote them to specific groups of people, as in Romans, or to churches, as in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, right? Um, the church letters. But these were unique, and they're important for us because they let us know how we should be organized and how we should be set up as a congregation. So they're important for us. And these are the only places in the Bible where we have the qualifications for elders and deacons. You won't find that any other place in the Bible except in these letters, these pastoral epistles. It's the only place we find that. Because Paul was telling them how to set up a congregation, what they should look for, the type of men they should look for. We're going to talk about this a little bit. I want you to keep that in your mind. The type of men they should look for. The letters offer advice to recipients about church order, false doctrine, leadership standards, and pastoral oversight of churches, which means those guys, Titus and Timothy, who we would say were pastoral. In other words, they were the ministering. I would not use that word. I would say they were the ministering evangelists of the congregations that they were trying to set up. You think that's right, Gary? You think they'd be the ministering evangelists of the congregations they were trying to set up, wouldn't you say? Timothy and Titus. Right, so they were the ones that were going to do it. Paul was giving them instructions as to how you do it. Yeah, Jennifer. The Jerusalem Council. Mm -hmm. Well, the Jerusalem Council had to deal with a division, a rift, because of Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians and how they were going to reconcile that. Antioch was the first Gentile church, but there were still Jewish Christians in Antioch, and that was the rift that occurred between Paul and Peter was because of the church in Antioch. So they were... A discussion about you know how they should interact how they should how they should get along what 
what they had to do. The Jews were trying to bind on them all this Jewish stuff. So basically, they went to have a meeting to say, how should we, how are we going to get along, in other words? What are we going to do to get along? And they did that by going, and of course, at that time, you had apostles. You had apostolistic authority. So they went to talk to them to come to an agreement because they wanted some authority to show the Jews in Antioch that, yes, this is what the apostles and the Jews in Jerusalem, this is what they think they need to do. Immorality, things sacrificed to idols. So it wasn't that they were looking for the church in Jerusalem to have oversight over the church in Antioch. They weren't looking for that. What they were trying to do was they were trying to get some Jewish authority and apostolic authority to ease the rift that was occurring in Antioch. So Paul and Barnabas and others went down because Paul always went out of Antioch. Antioch was Paul's like home base. You want to add to that, Gary, Brent? You know, they had to do that. We can go to the Bible and get confirmation, but they, of course, didn't have a Bible yet, so they were going to the apostles. Paul was basically going to the apostles to say, is what I'm doing the right thing? Paul always kind of struggled in his letters with the idea of calling himself an apostle and being the least of the apostles and being called out of season. And, you know, Paul makes mention that, you know, they even agreed with me, even though I hadn't met him. When we met, we agreed. Paul says that several times. Because Paul's always kind of fighting that, well, you weren't really one of the apostle, apostle, apostles. And I don't know if that was necessarily the case, because James was there too. And James was really an early church, what I call church father, you know. So, um, I mean, I think basically it was just like Paul was saying, we don't have to do these things anymore. But they, the Jews in Antioch were saying, oh, yeah, we do need to do those things. And I think Paul just needed to go down and talk to the apostles and say, okay, what do you say? You know, let, you need to tell these Jews, we need some authority here to say what we're doing. So I think they were just looking for that confirmation and authority. They weren't looking for them to necessarily rule over them. They just wanted their confirmation, more or less. Oh, yeah, I definitely think, yeah, for sure. But I think that you'd have to ask for that. I mean, I think it would be, and we do that. Sometimes we go to these elders' conferences and stuff. That's a lot of what it is. It's what other churches do and however their elders handling whatever situations are. Yeah, uh-huh. Right. I think churches, um, early church, when you start talking about Jerusalem Council, first century churches, they were in a lot of transition. There was a lot of flux going on there, and there were a lot of questions that needed to be answered. Like I say, unfortunately, they didn't have to, uh, unfortunately, they didn't have the Bible like we do. So, I mean, they had to go to someplace else to say, yeah, this is the authority. Well, where are you going to go? You're going to go to the apostles and say, hey, you're the authority you tell us, right? I mean, I think he would. I think that they were the authority at that particular point in history until the Bible became more solidified.
Yeah. Yeah, I think Peter was a big influence on Paul, you know, and Paul makes reference to that, you know, that him and, and then Paul stood opposed to Peter. You know, Paul and Peter had a huge conflict over this very thing. You know, he says, you're associating with the Jews. You know, that was the big conflict between, you know, Paul says, I've, you know, the, the, it says, you know, that Paul opposed Peter to his face. You know, in other words, it says, you're wrong. You know, what you're doing is wrong. So, you know, were there disagreements even among leadership? Uh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Um, early on, right from the beginning. So, um, you know, disagreements aren't new. Um, the, uh, and Timothy, now I think this has been a problem uh, in the church, in my opinion, for way too long. Um, you know, we'll look at both these lists, we'll probably get that done tonight, but We've talked about this. Gary's talked about it. Brent, we've, Jeff, we've all talked many times about this um, qualifications. This has been an issue in this church, most churches at some point. Um, you know, what does it mean? Is there anybody that's perfect? No. Is your shepherds going to be perfect? No. They're not going to be. They're not gonna, you can't going to find perfect men. I mean, they, they, they don't exist. We all understand that right? We're all human. We're all going to make mistakes. Um, so what are the, why does he give these lists? And what, and what does it really mean? And are they uh, ironclad? Well, yes and no, you know, um, is my opinion. And <laughs> Clyde's laughing at me. <laughs> but but uh, because we over the years in the church have let a lot of good elder men slipped through the cracks because we didn't think they met something on these lists. And, you know, I think there's a point here where we have to ask, and I think Brent says it the best, maybe, you know. It's not what type of man do you want, right? Isn't that how you say it? It's what type of man you want to lead, you know. Right. I think as I go through these lists, you're going to see what I'm talking about. I think because it's not so much the list, it's how we take some things out of this list. I think we need to talk about that a little bit. I think it'll make more sense. Um, I think it'll make more sense because I'm going to bring up some of the things that we squabble over and maybe look at that a little bit. Um, I understand what you're saying. But on the other hand, like you say, right? How do we look at it? How do we look at that piece of scripture? How do we look at that? We're always talking about that, right? And I think there's pieces in this we need to look at a little differently than traditionally the church has looked at them. So, and I'll bring that up as we go through here. I'm really not, I'm really going to take the gloves off on this, so we'll, we'll, we'll see. Well, I think it could go either way, but I don't think I don't think we have to make that division. I think if we just look at this, well, I, yeah, but let's say 
let's get into the deal. I mean, before we say, yeah, Jennifer. <laughs> <laughs> so what are we looking for? You're looking for a man who's faithful. You want somebody who wants to do the job, number one, right? Uh, you shouldn't lead, and I think we miss the first part of this a lot because we get so caught up in the rest of it that we miss the first part. You want somebody that desires the office. You want somebody that, want, that desires it. Why would a man want it? Why would anybody want to do that job. I mean, it's, it's a very thankless job. It really is. And why would you want to do that? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, you got three elders here, so ask them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, jump in there, some one of you guys. Tell me, why do you want to be an elder? <laughs> no, you don't have to talk over each other. <laughs> if you can, then you should. We'll talk about that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you're wrong, are you guilty or is he guilty? Why? You got to think. That's what you got to think of. <laughs> Let's talk about that next Wednesday night because we're out of time. Yeah, Billy. <laughs> yeah. Want to say something, Jeff, before we quit? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think that men, and we're, I know we're out of time, but I think that the, our elders, I think there's two reasons people desire, two reasons men desire to be an elder, in my opinion, there's two reasons. One of them is wrong. One of them is because they want to be in control of a church. You know, that's one reason that somebody wants to be an elder. That's the wrong reason to want to be an elder. The other reason people want to be an elder, or I think men want to be an elder, is because like Gary says, God calls us to do it. If we have the capability to do it and we're qualified to do it, then in my opinion, we're really not being who God wants us to be if we don't really step up to, be, to take that office. Why do you want to be an elder? Because the Bible says elders have a greater reward because they care for our souls. They have greater responsibility, but they have a greater reward, right? And I think that, and I, th and, and I think, you know, we need to let them speak during this and see what they say, you know. But I think that, uh, I think many, many years ago, we went on a fishing trip, me and Susie and Gary and Donna, long, long time ago. You all don't even remember, do you, Gary? Up to Arkansas, many, many years ago, when we were young and still had dark hair and all that. And uh, I remember we was fishing, and Gary said, I really want to be an elder. I remember him saying that to me, specifically. Never forget that. I'll never forget that. He's the only person in my life that ever said, I really desire to be an elder. So, you know, maybe next Wednesday night, we need to let them answer that question, because we're like five minutes over. But maybe we need to let them answer that question. Yeah. Well, I think that's why you have a different list in Titus than you do in Timothy. Timothy was in Ephesus. That was an older church. He had a little more probably to pick from. Poor Titus. Those churches were brand new, you know. And, I mean, if you even look at the way Paul writes about the people on Crete, Cretans are all gluttons and lazy, right? <laughs> Isn't that what Paul says? They're all lazy gluttons, right? So t t poor Titus didn't have the pool to pick from that Timothy had to pick from. And I think that's why you have a different list. But we'll talk more about it. I'm glad you're interested in this. I think it's a great discussion, a discussion we should have. And I'm glad our elders are here. And hopefully you'll get to ask them. I think you should, they should have the chance to speak and ask them because they're our elders. And they, you know, they're guys that made that decision. And I haven't made that decision. And obviously not many of us in here. Clyde's been an elder and, and has made that decision before. So, um, so anyway, we'll talk about that next Wednesday. Thanks for your time.